All right, let's do it. Um, everyone on the line, thank you so much for joining. Uh, really excited to kick this thing off. This is BasePath's first of ever webinars. Uh, we've got a big series coming up, um, but super excited to start it with one of my close friends, the guy I've known for over a decade, Greg Sullivan. Um, Greg, thanks so much for joining us, man. No, happy to be here. Thanks for having me, T. And uh, and appreciate kind of everyone in the audience bearing with us as we kind of figure this thing out as, as we're going along. Right now, we can't see you or hear you. You should be able to see a, a little Q&A box uh, somewhere on your screen to, to ask questions. We're going to probably take 15, 20 minutes to just kind of go through some you know, plan stuff with Greg to have him kind of walk us through some of the key items that we're, we're hoping to have him help us with as, as we're kind of stepping into, you know, the continuing education side of, of base path. Um, but yeah, we may decide to change this thing for the next one that we have with Sam in a couple of weeks, but uh, yeah, appreciate your patience with us as we're, we're figuring it out. So I'm um, going to start it with just kind of a, a quick introduction um, into Greg, uh, Greg Nova, proud Nova grad. Um, I actually met Greg about 10 years ago um, when we were both continuing our education, getting our MBAs at, at the University of Notre Dame. Um, we both were concentrating in finance at the time. Greg was the president of the finance club. He actually gifted me a VP role um, to boost up my resume, for which I still owe him. Um, VP probably got me my... And, and now, <laughs> now we're on a <laughs> webinar. Who would have ever dreamed that it would have been as appropriate as it is today? Um, Look at us. Because at the time, I was just trying to get a job at Whirlpool. Um, but uh, yeah, if you're you're not familiar with you know the the credentials that you can see here, Greg obviously took the continuing education uh, piece of of this a little bit more seriously than most. Um, he has a CFA, a CAIA, a CDAA. Um, the one that I find most impressive, if you don't know what a CFA is, look it up, like see how hard it is to actually get one of those things. It's like a three-year process and you can't fail it. Um, but really, I know, Greg, you're using a lot of that stuff to, to really kind of help bolster, you know, portfolio management, asset management, you know, whether it's alternative investments, digital assets um, for your customers and the folks that that are coming to you for advice and we get asked all the time from our collectives from our universities from our athletes you know how do we determine and identify who are the right folks to be talking to the more letters next to a person's name probably the better and and i think greg's got the right ones next to his um we're going to be stepping into just going a couple of quick slides here just to kind of you know preempt the discussion just to get you guys familiar with what we're going to talk about Again, we'll dive into each one of these in a little bit more depth, and we'll we'll provide these slides to you along with the recording. Um, and one other thing too, we'll we'll add in Greg's LinkedIn and Twitter handles as well. If you haven't followed him or, or don't you know know of him yet, his voice is getting bigger and bigger within the sports finance space in particular, and and is already starting to see a lot of you know, exciting things that he's bringing into the to this industry as he's kind of getting more and more involved in it. But um, Greg, again, dude, super excited to have you. Um, and appreciate you taking the time. No, this is going to be fun, man. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of different things. We'll we'll start kind of on the savings and investment side, looking at you know what are the key steps if you're really for the first time kind of stepping into the the financial management world. You know what are the things that you're going to be thinking about from a budgeting emergency fund. You know how you're setting up your accounts. Uh, from there, we're going to try to hit on some of just like the key fundamentals of investments in, in asset management from, you know, the power of compounding interest, looking at risk return, offense versus defense diversification, you know, doing things that in the most cost-effective way possible. And then from there, just looking at, you know, asset management, you know, how are you allocating your assets? How are you, where are those assets located? And thinking through kind of the alphanumeric um, options that seem to be thrown around between IRAs, 529s, 403, all those fun things. So um, super excited to to have Greg here to, to kind of talk through all of this with us. And with that, dude, I'm just going to start off with, we all the time now, you know, we've gotten much more involved in kind of the financial lives of student athletes just by consequence of how we're helping to facilitate funds going to them. Um, we have customers in collectives and universities that ask us, and we have students, student athletes that are directly asking us, hey, we're either providing a lot of you know, financial resources to these young men and women, or we're receiving it. 
how can I help you? Or how can I be helped? Or how do I manage this? Like, and I guess just to start, like if you're coming in and I know you've been involved with a couple of these collectives and universities and athletes already, like what are the first steps that you are taking to try to help them understand what to do with this by changing money? Yeah, it's funny. I, I think the first step forward is usually a, a step back, right? And then trying to see the whole picture. Um, whenever you have a broad audience, especially like the student athlete cohort currently, uh, you have to preface the conversation with the understanding that each student is going to have their own unique circumstances. And there's a wide spectrum of situations, right? You could have a student athlete that comes from a financially stable home. They could be financially literate, very secure in themselves and how they make decisions. And they could even have their parents covering their day-to-day -day expenses, right? So that's one end, an individual that's in a good spot to begin thinking about saving and investing. On the other end, you could have a student athlete that is less resource, that um, you know not only is maybe financially insecure, but has to think about their day-to-day -day expenses um, and covering potentially their family's day-to-day -day needs, contributing back home. And then you'll have everybody that falls in between. So in the advice industry, you know that eventually when you get to um, potential solutions, everything needs to be tailored to that individual. Professionals need to do a good job of just listening up front. Um, and we should be under the understanding that there's no one solution that's going to speak across the student athlete population, right? So collective should be well armed with that information. This webinar is more about putting some structure in place to help with those specific, more detail oriented conversations down the road, the one on ones, if you will. Sure. Yeah. And how are you like, because I hear that often, you know, you need to have a tailored approach on an individual level. Like, how do you scale that when you're brief, you know, I know you've been a part of some of these conversations with these collectives and institutions. Like it's easy to obviously put the best practices and, you know, here's your educational materials. Like how are you trying to scale up kind of the individual advice side of this? Yeah. Advice, um, advice at scale is difficult because it needs to be personalized, but there's ways in which you can think about, scaling efficiency or scaling efficiently best practices. When these conversations start, the last thing a student needs to feel is pressure, right? They've earned the right to work toward a degree and now they have the opportunity to benefit from their hard work outside the classroom. It's always good to begin to think about investing. The earlier, the better, right? We, we know that kind of now with, with all the information that's out there, um, but in order to achieve successful outcomes, you need to be patient. In order to be patient, you need to be armed with the right perspective. And, and to have that perspective, you need access to the right education channels, communication that's going to resonate, access to professionals and expertise. Um, so to get back to your question, what, what can be scaled, like in any sport, um, you think about game plan, right? And having a game plan. Um, unlike sports, uh, this game of investing, it, it's played out in perpetuity, right? So it's ongoing. Uh, but there should be a natural order of operations in terms of how you think about it, right? So how I've approached these conversations, whether it's uh, from a more general level or starting with an individual from scratch at all different levels of understanding, you start with a budget, right? Understanding what's coming in, what's going out, beginning to quantify what you can put towards a savings plan, understanding why a savings plan is necessary, why it's important and why it's needed before you earn the right to think about investing. Investing is a privilege. It's something that should be earned and something when done right, you go into it with a long-term mindset. Yeah. So I think talk about the investing side as being a privilege and I assume, it, I mean, when I was coming out of undergrad, I had not the slightest idea of how I could even get involved in the investment side. And so like my money just sat in a checking account probably um, before I could even think about doing something with it that would potentially help me in the future. 
we're in kind of the opposite world now that we're starting to find where the ubiquity of investment, you know, vehicles is everywhere, you know, like yeah. the Robin Hoods, the Acorns, you know, it seems as though athletes are starting to, you know, just dive right into the investment side without maybe setting up the saving side first. Um, I feel like that's probably a unique problem for this generation of athletes that hasn't existed up until now. Like, how are you helping to kind of frame up the difference between savings and investing for, you know, these young men and women that are dealing with life changing money? Yeah, the gamification of trading, um, which is different from investing, and 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 we'll make sure we're clear on that. But through these apps and technologies, yeah, totally fair. By the way, I, I like that. <laughs> That's well said. Right, and 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 the way in which we digest information now, which is by every minute and every second. And if I opened up the screens to see the the you know the trading floor in the background, you'd see all these TVs. Right, that is um, you know throwing tickers and information at us by the right. second. Um, so it's difficult, right? Which is why you have to have this foundation, is why you have to stick to these principles to set yourself up for, for longer term success. Um, you know, I, I think about budgeting being that first layer of protection um, and it's not easy, right? So uh, whether it's uh, tracking your expenses and there's many apps that can help us do that. Um, but, uh, it's, it doesn't come natural. And I know this because I try to do it in my, my day to day. Uh, but when you begin to understand what you spend day to day, week to week, month to month, uh, you begin to get a handle on your finances. It's important for students to know, and this is where the pressure element comes in. You don't want a financial plan to get in the way of you living your life, right? Like I said, you're working hard. Uh, you're a kid, uh, you're a young adult, uh, you want to go out, right? You want to spend, you want to buy clothes, you want to maybe support your family, build in some flexibility to this financial plan. Um, but know that there's layers of complexity now, especially as the more dollars you earn, the more opportunities you have in this new world, right? So what probably is new for these individuals um, is the tax line item within a budget, right? And Thomas, I know your team yeah. Oh, yeah, does dude. a lot on that front. Yeah, I mean, we sent out thousands and thousands of 1099s ranging from $600 to six figures. So yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a significant one. And I'll, I'll just tell you anecdotally, you know, we get a lot of questions from athletes as we were just trying to set up the 1099s for these kids. Like, Hey, we just need to create a W9. It's like, Hey, if I don't, if I'm not using your app anymore, do I still need to pay tax? It's like some of the disconnects that are out there from, from these young are women real? are just like, yeah, it's, it's, that education side, they just don't have a, the comprehension of, you know, I, I tell every one of the kids this, it's like, listen, you know, you mess up an NIL, the NCAA might come after you and like, bummer, you might lose a year of eligibility or something like, dude, you mess up on your taxes, like the IRS don't play, like those guys yeah. will find it, like, yes. and they will come after you. And so just trying to help them to understand kind of the the importance of, you know, listen, obviously we want you to set yourself up for success, you know, in the long term and talk to folks like Greg and others that are out there, but at least protect yourself from, from the downside because you don't want to set yourself back because you had this great windfall, you know, in years yeah. 18 through 22 of your life. Yeah. No, there's real liability there. Right. And, and although, uh, you know, I have, earn designations or, or there's 10 letters after my name, whatever. I don't have a CPA, right? I'm not a CPA. Uh, so it, it's important even more so now understanding, right? That the IRS is not the NCAA, that there's real, real penalties, long-term associated penalties that could be associated with not filing correctly. Um, that that you should be doing this uh, with, with certain resources in place and potentially seeking out the advice of a professional. Uh, you know, so as of right now, right, so in, in, and we threw out some numbers and letters again, as, as we always do when we talk uh, financial services, but um, students now are not W-2 employees, right? They are independent contractors, right? So they're self-employed. It's an important designation. So when, when you just said the 1099 reports, that's the tax form that you receive 
if you're self-employed and you earn more than $600, right? So if you earn more than $600 in any NIL deal, you will receive a 1099 tax form. What that entails, right, in terms of things for students to be mindful of, and you'll begin to get an understanding of why it's important to seek out some, some resources beyond just yourself or, or the transparency that's delivered in an app. Um, you know, there's taxable income, right? Taxable income goes beyond for these student athletes, just the cash they receive, the checks that are sent their way, or the direct deposits in their name. What needs to be reported also is free gifts, right? Uh, merchandise that's sent their way, uh, loaner vehicles, uh, rides on private jets, right? We just saw the, the Nicholas Air deal that, that was well, well publicized. Uh, all of these need to be uh, reported as, as income. What, what can be helpful? Understanding deductibles, right? So some of the expenses associated with completing your NIL deals can be deducted. Uh, knowing what to deduct, right? This is another area potentially you could get in trouble or you, you might be inefficient. Um, so areas like travel to events, um, using software for your social channels, um, fees related to conversations like this one, right? If, if you have a, a, a formal uh, mandate with a, a CPA professional and there's a fee associated with it, that can be deducted. That allows you to get to an income level where you know what's what what's payable, right? So from a federal, state, local tax perspective, what you owe. Not only that, and here's another where the 1099 throws another wrinkle at you. You owe the employee and the employer side of Medicare and Social Security tax. Um, and then there's there's even more wrinkles um, when it comes to 1099s, like best practices, yeah. paying quarterly, um, having estimates. Sure. So you will Sure. charges some of these athletes that are earning six figures plus that interest could be sizable um so you want to have a handle on uh this line item when it comes to your budget having a good handle on it your earned revenue your expectations what it costs right for your day-to-day -day, that allows you to begin to quantify what you can put toward a savings plan how you can move toward that next step um, on your investment journey makes sense and yeah i think it all comes down to find someone that has those three letters uh, to, to help you on that journey. Um, I know you've had some success, you know, helping athletes, helping organizations kind of as they're, they're working through this journey. Like what yeah. are the, some of the, what are some of the things that you've found help to resonate with these athletes um, as, as they've kind of come to recognize the importance of this topic yeah, look, I think real world examples always help, you know, is speaking less in terms of theory and, and putting some numbers behind, um, putting some numbers behind the, the concepts that, sure. that you're trying to translate. So when you move like savings, right? So when you move into this plan for, uh, or when you move into the next step, which is creating or forming a savings plan, quantifying beyond uh, what's left over after you're covering your expenses. Um, there's, there's, there's this concept of having an emergency fund, right? Or a rainy day fund, some people call it. Sure. And there's rules of thumb, right? Three, three months of, of a covered expenses, six months of covered expenses. What should be understood is that um, everyone's different, right? And I, I touched on this up front. What's going to be comfortable for you might be different for somebody else, but the longer you cover your expenses, the more comfortable you should be when you move into that investment plan um, and commit to staying invested. Okay, um, so so this next layer of savings, right, is is important um, and and even more so important when you think about the higher rate interest rate environment that we're in, right? So a lot of these students that I've spoken to have started some savings, uh, but it's sitting in a checking account. It's sitting in a checking account that's earning uh, one basis point. So one basis point is 1% of 1%. Uh, not exactly an attractive return on, on your investment. In this higher interest rate world, there's options out there, and keeping it simple, like a savings account, that will offer returns of anywhere between, I mean, if you're shopping at around 300 basis points up to 500 basis points uh, in, in this environment. So that's 
three percent to, to five percent return on, on on your money um annualized right so um in this uh you know example right where a, a student's covered their expenses uh and they find out that they're spending around one thousand dollars per month they feel really comfortable that if their revenue uh, top line changed in any way, they'd want about a year, right, in terms of cover to figure out what's next, right? So if that revenue worst case scenario turned off, how can they get through the next 12 months? That'd be saving, your savings plan should account for $12,000. Um, and putting that in a savings account versus a checking account, and this is where you say what translates to students. When you put dollars behind it, it helps them right, really understand what's going on here. So that $12,000 sitting in a savings account earning 5% at the end of one year would generate $600 of interest. If it was just sitting in that checking account where most students have it right now, um, you're, you're not even covering a cup of coffee at the end of the sure. year. Yeah, um, so, so I, I do appreciate that. I, I think we've come to find that helping on the data visualization side, like giving these athletes a more insight into, you know, what's actually going on within their financial lives has been incredibly meaningful. Um, yeah. I, know, I know we've been, you know, from day one trying to, to be bring more and more of that just to demystify, you know, some of the implications of what's going on within their own lives um, and helping to kind of consolidate the, the complexity that, that they're faced with because, you know, even in the simple ways that, that we're explaining this today, I could see how that could be overwhelming. Just going through a budget process alone is, is a chore, not to mention thinking about layering in an emergency fund and a savings plan and different accounts and, and all that stuff. Like, so, yeah, man, um, I'm gonna ask kind of one follow, one more follow-up question, and then um, we'll jump into q and We see a couple already kind of in the queue here, but, um, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to drop them in um, as we go into this. But, you know, Greg, we've talked about some of the kind of the, the buzzwords. Um, asset allocation, I haven't touched on that much yet to this point. Like, what is what is that um, term? I've heard it floated around a couple of times. I've seen you post about it a few times. Like, it's becoming a bigger part of the, the vocabulary these days within the financial world. Like, what does that mean for a student athlete? What does that mean for collectives and universities that are trying to educate their athletes on it? Yeah, so asset allocation is, it's it's the distribution of your investments across asset classes. Okay, a lot, lot of words there. Uh, Define asset classes, please. Right, yeah. So again, um, mostly when I've had these conversations, kids are asking about stocks. Right. So we start there. Right. And then, uh, you know, it's, I think it's important that I cover some general uh, perspective when it comes to approaching an investment in stocks. And I'll do that in, in, in a second. But um, you, normally, over the course of time, a portfolio, so a group of investments in an account, will take on more than just one asset class. So stocks, there's bonds. Right. So stocks represent ownership and there's an undefined return potential associated with that equity ownership um, and bonds uh, take on a representation or an investment of a loan. Right. So there's a fixed term and a defined interest. So um, stocks generally uh, a premium. Right. When you think about return, also a premium when you think about risks or volatility or swings, change in prices, um, bonds, much less so. Right. And, and oftentimes when asset allocation is discussed, the principle of diversification is is, is broached, right? Um, so ideally, in situations more often than not, when when equities rally, bonds maybe not be doing as much in terms of return, and then vice versa. When 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 stocks see some some downside, uh, bonds have the potential to rally, and there, there's elements associated to that. But that's uh, the benefit of diversification, so that you're experiencing some level of um, growth, right, that, that you're comfortable with um, and have different elements of return within that basket of investments in your account, right? So I, I hope that's helpful and I hope I didn't use too much. Uh, no, it, it, it sounds to me like age. asset allocation and diversification, which is another word we, we hear often are, are probably one, maybe not one and the same, but closely tied to each other. Um, yeah, perfect, man. Anything else from your side before we kind of jump into the to the Q&A? 
Yeah, look, I I think it's important, you know, to touch on asset location, right? J just as much as asset allocation. Um, and, and what that means is these individuals, and just like the checking account example, uh, these kids, their first step into investing tends to be in these uh, taxable brokerage accounts. And when I say taxable, I mean that any income or realized gains associated in a brokerage account is subject to tax, right? There are um, retirement accounts like a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA, both with their own unique circumstances, both with their own limitations in terms of contribution, funding, and future access. Again, reasons to maybe consult a professional or have resources around um, how you approach them, but there's tax benefits to funding those first, right? And that should be understood. Um, so your first question out of the gate shouldn't be what to invest, it should be where to invest. Uh, and more often than not, general rule of thumb is to max out your contributions um, to these retirement accounts so you have those tax benefits. What matters to investors are net returns, right? So returns net of tax, and ultimately, right, your tax liability at the end of the year. So these retirement accounts allow you to potentially uh, lower uh, that tax liability and achieve uh, higher net returns. So it's a really good first step in terms of having exposure um, and, and really having that long-term mindset and letting this money compound over time. Love it. And I need to be doing that myself, if I'm being honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. One of the questions in the chat from uh, from someone from a collective, you talked about kind of the one on one version of, of finances, and, and we've largely done this ourselves to, to help student athletes. Like, where is the, the 201, 301 um, portion of, of financial management and in wealth management that we can provide to our athletes? Yeah, look, I think a couple ways to look at this, right? And then let's use real examples. Let, let's go through kind of the, the budgeting, uh, saving and investing uh, protocol that we put in place uh, for these conversations. Savings, right? Simple, straightforward, but the 102 conversation could mean accessing money market accounts, could mean shopping uh, around CDs, certificates of deposits at different banks, trying to solve for premium yield when it comes to that liquidity bucket, when it comes to uh, saving for your emergency reserve, how do we maximize that return potential on that subset of assets? Um, for most, it, it could be, let's keep it simple. Um, let's, let's, let's not overthink it. For others that are earning multiples of six figures year in and year out uh, during their college years, which could be anywhere between I don't know, two, three, four, five, six. I think we've seen examples of seven year student athletes at, at this point um, post COVID. So um, there, there's ways in which to think about that savings plan and, and maximize um, your return potential. Um, investing conversations, there's 102 or 103 or 104. You know, there, there's a variety of ways you can explore. What I've done with student athletes um, is begin to walk them through um, in an own way, in an unfiltered way, in a way in which each of them feel comfortable asking questions, um, but um, allow them to ask questions on the asset class themselves. So when they do have the time, when they quantify the investment, again, nine out of 10 times, it's about a, it's about a single stock. I try to provide perspective onto the risks associated with approaching that asset class, the stock market equities, in a way in which they feel uh, heard, but have resources beyond just saying, Tesla looks interesting, or you know, how do I think about NVIDIA? I see it every day on TV, I, I wanna get invested. Um, there's these diversified tools uh, or investment vehicles, uh, ETFs, right? That are low cost and provide a, uh, a broad diversification. Um, a, a starter investment, I always look at the 500 largest U.S. stocks. Um, it's been a good determinant of return over long time periods. Uh, over the last 100 years, that asset or, or that sector, that index has compounded at, at about 10% annually. Um, but um, 
you know, it, it, there's there's certain risks associated with it still, even though you're getting a diversified exposure. The point is, it's going to be high quality because of your you have exposure to these large cap mature U.S. companies, and um, and um, you know, there's there, there should be less volatility than uh, or risk than investing in a Tesla or a Nvidia out of the gate. Another question from from a collective. What, if any, liability do we have as the organization trying to help to support our student athletes on their financial journey? Um, and I, I suspect that's coming in the form of, hey, we're providing advice, we're providing some, you know, like, hey, this is who we think you should try to, to work with or, or talk with, you know, is there any liability on their side as, as they're trying to help to support their athletes through that journey? With the understanding that, in truth, and I believe this, they, they are really just trying to help. Um, yeah. But I, I think you have, and I, I appreciate this question because I, I think I've seen it with some others as well, where there's almost a, you know, an apprehension to, to get too involved on that side of the house because, you know, God forbid we put someone in touch with someone and this, you know, young adult loses some, or whatever. Like, where do you kind of see the, the world of liability as it relates to to helping to support these athletes on on their journey. Yeah, look, I, I think collectives were formed for a very specific purpose. And that purpose is not providing financial advice, but you know, the, I, I think it's well understood that there is some responsibility, right? As, as these collectives grow larger, as these students um, gain more and more access, or, or have the opportunity to earn larger uh, sums of money. Um, so putting resources in place, helping thought leaders in the industry provide access uh, to their to their best thinking or, or tutelage, I, I think makes sense. For um, collectives, I think what should be in place or what I believe is some sort of credentialization, credentialization system, right? So being able to soundly qualify individuals, and, and you can do that, you know, the letters help, the designations, whether it's a CFA or ones that I don't have, like a CFP, um, that helps, you know, check one box. Others are platforms they're associated with. You should be, uh, you know, certified individuals will be with a, any anyone from a registered RIA, which could be completely independent, um, a large bold bracket bank, um, a, a legacy uh, uh, nor, um, trust company or a large private banking institution. To be employed at those places where there's registration, where they're highly regulated, and you have these credentials, that gives you a good understanding of who that individual is, what they're about. Now, before you make any uh, one-off introductions, I'd always um, recommend meeting, having conversations, getting to know that person, but potentially a roster of individuals that may be able to communicate uh, and, and connect with different individuals because, like I said, student the student body is going to be very diversified in terms of who's who makes it up and different voices will resonate with with different individuals yeah i love that i think that's well said i think we are starting to see collectives taking on more of the responsibility for basically the second wave of what they're doing so beyond just providing the the financial you know awards then helping them to to kind of manage that moving forward. So that's great. Um, Greg, really appreciate the time. We we did have a, another question in there, which is how do we engage with Greg? Um, we'll send out Greg's contact information as part of, you know, this recording and the slides and, you know, some of the other stuff that, that will come out of this. So um, yeah, please reach out to Greg. I have a ton of trust in him. You know, he's done a lot of great work within this space and again, becoming a, a big thought leader within within the industry already. Um, Greg, looks like you have one more thing to, you know, Thomas, I to say. Thank you for the time with, with uh, you know, everybody that, that you work with uh, in your vast network in this world. I think what, what should be said um, is that I provide access, direct access for student athletes on my calendar. It's all pro bono work. It's, it's, it's volunteer based. Um, it's two hours every Friday and it, it, and it's makeup time where it's one-on-one -on -one and it could be, there's a lot of students that reach out from networking purposes and thinking about career and it gives me time to give back, but also it's become um, a lot of time for, for those that are earning significant sums in, uh, in, in the NIL world and doing classes like in stock market 101, um, things like that. So 
Um, it's available, it's out there. Thomas has all my details and I'm happy to make time uh, for students uh, associated with your collective if, uh, if it makes sense. And, and really appreciate it, dude. And I know you've been a huge help to a lot of folks already and at absolutely no cost and just trying to, you know, really help to support this industry, which has a need, you know, for the first time and it's in its hundred year existence for, for how to help athletes to actually deal with the complexities that are hitting them for the very first time in, in their existence. So really appreciate the time. Thank you everyone who joined um, the inaugural Base Path webinar series. Um, if you have any feedback or thoughts on how we can improve this thing moving forward, shoot them over, let us know. We'll, we'll be sure to integrate them in for next time. But, but thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. And thank you, Greg, again.